Welcome to Real Estate Pro Tips and Strategies. The theme is how to buy a home or sell a home in a changing real estate market. Hi, my name is Pete Sabine and I'm here with my team partner, Leslie Whitney. We are real estate professionals with Compass and the Five Star Real Estate Team here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We want to share with you our real estate expertise to give you a competitive edge and provide insight with useful information so you can make an informed decision for your next home purchase. Leslie and I break down the most important aspects of real estate. Future podcasts will reveal how to navigate as a home buyer or seller. Let's begin our podcast. Hi, today we're going to talk about how to know your real estate market trends. So Pete, what are the signs to look for that confirms a buyer's market, which is one of the market trends? Yeah, so the classic buyer's market is where we have more than six months of available inventory for sale based on the rate of closed sale transactions. And some of the telltale signs of a buyer's market would be an increasing supply of homes for sale, or more commonly known as active listings. Also an increase on how long it takes for homes to sell, days on market. So if the days on market is increasing over time from one to two weeks to two to three months, and the supply of available homes is increasing at the same time, that means there's more supply than there is demand. So we also look at how many new pending sales are occurring each month. And if the pending sales activity is declining while the inventory of active listings is increasing, now we have a supply and demand imbalance in favor of buyers. They have more homes to choose from. The other telltale sign to look at are seller concessions, meaning the original asking price, watching that asking price and seeing if there's any movement downward where the seller is making price adjustments, maybe sometimes two or three before that property actually goes pending and sells. Other seller concessions would be things like credits for repairs or things of that nature, any type of concessions. So we're located in the Bay Area of California, and that's mainly what we're talking about. When was the most recent buyer's market in the Bay Area? Well, the most severe, significant buyer's market that I've seen in 35 years would be the one in 2008, when we had the financial crisis, where we had a huge oversupply of homes. We had sellers trying to sell their way out of the problem and increase the supply with little confidence in the market because of the meltdown in the financial markets and little demand. So 2008 to 2010 to 2011, that was the era of a buyer's market in the San Francisco Bay Area. And in fact, in most part of the countries, it was that way as well. So the opposite of a buyer's market would be a seller's market. And what are the signs to look for that confirm it's a seller's market? Well, typically, a seller's market is defined by less than three months of active listing inventory based on the amount of closed sales each month. Also, decreasing supply of homes for sale, which are known as active listings. The days on market is less than two weeks. High buyer demand, which means the number of pending sales each month exceeds or meets the supply. Multiple offers, overbidding, above the list price, as is sales with no seller concessions. Those are the hallmarks of the classic seller's market. And what do you think are some things that could trigger a seller's market? A lot of things can trigger a seller's market. Seller's market can be triggered by external events in the economy. It could be triggered by interest rates falling. When interest rates drop, and decrease, that acts as an accelerant to a market trend. When interest rates start to rise, that acts as a decelerant, meaning things tend to slow down as the cost of money increases. When the cost of money gets cheaper, it puts more money, more buyers into the marketplace, and that increases demand. 
All right. So we talked about the buyer's market, a seller's market, and then there also is sort of a neutral market. And um, what can you say about how buyers can find the best deals in a neutral market? Well, a neutral market happens to be my favorite market, and that is that it's balanced. A balanced market is where we have about three to six months of active inventory for sale based on the rate of closed sales. That means that Neither the buyer or the seller has an unfair advantage because of supply and demand dynamics. It also makes for a much more comfortable, enjoyable environment to buy or sell a home. Uh, It just seems like it's a much, it's a fair market environment where people can put a sale together and one party doesn't have the upper hand advantage over another. All right. And so for a seller, what's, what are some things that they can do to get the best price for their property in a neutral market? Well, I can tell you in a seller's market, they pretty much don't have to do anything. Buyers accept the house in as-is condition with little to no repair concessions. In a balanced market, you typically have to do more because you don't have the upper hand with lack of supply and high demand. So doing more means getting more involved with preparing the home for sale, taking care of deferred maintenance, getting pre-sale property inspections and making any repairs to that that are recommended, tuning up the property cosmetically, staging the home, landscaping tune-up. Those are all things that a seller would typically do in a neutral market. So obviously these markets change over time. Um, What is the dynamic of a market trend in transition? What what happens there when things are moving? So a transition market is one that's shifting from a buyer's market to a neutral market or from a seller's market to a neutral or to a buyer's market. I've seen markets go to extremes in a very short amount of time from a seller's market to a buyer's market in a matter of months and, and the neutral market gets skipped over. Transitional markets are the probably the most difficult markets to navigate as a buyer or a seller. And that's because in the early stages of a market in transition, the protocol, the rules for engagement, no longer apply. Now, if it's a seller's market going to a buyer or a neutral market, the seller seller still wants to believe that it's a seller's market. And so they act as if it still is, but the buyers know differently. The buyers see more houses to choose from and they can take more time and be more discriminating about what they want to buy that meets their needs. They don't have to compromise or over-compromise because of lack of supply. And so the negotiating strategy of a buyer that recognizes that the market's beginning to shift more into their favor, the sellers are often disappointed because the offers they receive are not over the asking price with no concessions and the house is taking longer to sell. Right, so it's important to realize that buyers and sellers might not be on the same page about the rules of engagement depending on how they see the market and where it's at in the, in the moment. Um, but it is what is the importance of recognizing what the market is doing and how can uh, market trends impact how a buyer and a seller negotiate with each other? Well, that's why we're talking about this because as a buyer or a seller, before you jump into the market, no matter what the trend is. You want to understand what that trend is for you in the market that you're looking in or or where you have a house to sell. And real estate is really a patchwork of what I call micro markets. Uh, I've seen within the same zip code because of unique circumstances, school districts and proximity to, uh, you know, the things that you want and that type of thing that you can have a softer market in one end of town and a hot seller's market on the other end of town. So as a buyer, you need to understand, you know, based on where you're looking and the slice of market that you're in, are you in a buyer's market, a seller's market, or a neutral market? It's going to define your negotiating strategy and your house hunting protocol. Same thing as a seller. You have to be really clear about what market you're participating in when you go to sell your house so that you can align your strategy with the reality of the marketplace that you're in and its trends. So the markets can shift in different directions um, relatively quickly, or how does how quickly does that happen, and how can a buyer or a seller predict 
the market shift before it happens to um, be at an advantage? You know, there's some parallels to the way the stock market operates when you see a trend from a bull to bear market. Typically, when a market in general begins to hit top or bottom, it'll spike a couple of times. But you'll notice that it's beginning to falter. It's just not on a straight hockey stick type of a curve up or down. You begin to see some signs that that trend is beginning to shift. So we watch for that. And... Uh, we've also seen when markets top out, we'll go through a period of time where we're actually operating in a different trend periodically, and then we have another spike, and then after that, it begins to trend the other direction. So let's say I'm new to real estate investing, and I want to get started. How do I know when the market is right for me to jump in? How do I get ahead of the market and, and predict where it's going to make the best out of my investment? So as a real estate investor, a lot of it has to do with where you're buying and your, and your buying goals. In other words, if you are a buy and hold investor, that you are looking for income producing property, and your plan is to hold that property over a number of years so it appreciates in value, and while it's doing that, you're enjoying hopefully positive cash flow from that property, your strategy might be quite different than if you are what I call a professional home rehabber, which means that you're speculating in the marketplace like a day trader. You're buying low, hopefully. You're building out the property to its optimum value. You're putting it back on the market, hopefully quickly before the market changes. And you're capturing profit because you're riding the trend of an up, uptrend market. Um, so depending on what your goals are as an investor, if you're the long-term buy and hold investor, market trends don't matter as much because you're going to hold that property for a long period of time. In California, our market cycles, real estate market cycles, typically go through a 10-year period from one type of market trend to another. Um, there have been exceptions to that, but generally speaking, it's always best to buy as a buyer in a buyer's market if you can time the market and sell when it's a seller's market. Um, what's really critical is for the rehab contractor that wants to flip properties for a profit. If you catch the market too late, you could end up being a buy and hold investor, meaning you go to put it up for sale and the market has shifted. You can't hit your profit goal with your price. And because of how much money you put into the property, you're now forced to hold it until the market shifts in your favor. And that might be a long time. It might take years before it comes back again. Okay, so it does seem to be important to sort of know, understand what the buyer's long-term goals are. Um, why is the housing market cyclical? And how do you think the California real estate market has evolved over the last 40 years? Well, California and typically the coastal United States markets are far more volatile than the central part of our country, which is much much more of a stable, flatline environment for price appreciation. Uh, coastal markets are more volatile. They're a little more prone to market cycles. Um, but overall, external factors like the economy, the job market, the employment rate, those types of things changes in the tax code, um, being able to deduct mortgage interest rates, um, tax deferred exchanges, the home loan market, the availability of financing and the cost of financing. All of those factors, when they shift or change, creates a market cycle. And the market cycle can be either positive or it can be declining. Over the last 40 years or so, we've had significant occurrences of external factors. In the early 1980s, we had really high inflation. Mortgage rates were north of 15%. When I got into real estate in 1990, 1985, interest rates had just drifted down from 13 to 12%, and everybody thought that was great. And now we have interest rates that are sometimes just shy of 3%. So um, that was definitely a buyer's market in that era 
unless the seller was willing to participate in the financing to sell their home, a lot of homes couldn't sell because the buyers couldn't afford the mortgage based on the high interest rates. That created a buyer's market. In the early 90s, we had a recession that was triggered by the Gulf War event. We were at the tail end of a mini seller's market that started in the late 1980s. And as we got into the early 1990s, by the time the Gulf War started in 1992, things began to soften. That recession lasted about three to four years, and it wasn't until 1996, 97 that the market began to reverse its course and become more of a seller's market. And then we got to the late 1990s and early 2000s. But by that time, the banking industry had been deregulated. And when that happened, we started to see a lot of creative financing make its way into the residential real estate market. We had a lot of folks in the dot-com industry come in to found money, as we call it. They were buying real estate. They had a lot of money to throw around. They created a they added an excel, as an accelerant to that market trend of a seller's market in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then we had 9-11. And 9-11 was, of course, what I call a, a black swan event. Those events don't happen very often. In some cases, they, you don't see something like this in your lifetime. When that happened, we didn't know if we were going to have a real estate market. I mean, that's the tail end of, of that year. Real estate was essentially shut down. People were just not moving. Everything was put on hold. And it wasn't until the beginning of the following year that we began to see activity come back into the marketplace. And uh, the federal government got in. They started uh, relaxing interest rates, stimulating the economy. And it brought the market back. It took a couple of years for us to get back on track again, but we did. And all the, all the while, while that was happening, these creative financing programs were making their way to the street, putting money in people's hands that probably never should have been allowed to borrow it. That led up to the market plateauing in 2005 through 2007 across the nation this 10-year run of a seller's market began to top out. And everything started to unwind in 07 into 2008 with the financial crisis created by the banking industry that created the real estate boom and everything went boom, it blew up. So those were extreme events, external events that affected housing markets all across the country. Not that no market that I'm aware of escaped the forces of those external events. So in March of this year, the COVID pandemic hit. And how has it impacted the real estate market? And what were your predictions before this happened for 2020? And how did this shutdown derail those predictions, if they did at all? Well, let's start with how the pandemic impacted the market. Um, that is another black swan event that occurred. And it was unique in that it was global this time. It wasn't just with our country and a financial market meltdown. It was a global event, which is unprecedented. And it really stopped everything in its tracks. You know, March 17th, I was standing in a listing where we're trying to get it ready to sell. We had the stager there, the contractor, the painter, the inspectors, the homeowner. We had a house full of people. And all of a sudden, six cell phones start going off with the civil defense code, shut down, locked down, all this, you know, it was like right out of a movie. You know, it was a, you know, that'll probably stay with me for the rest of my life. It's kind of seared in my psyche. That whole little, that day was special. Um, and after that, real estate, as a profession was not recognized yet as an essential service. So essentially, all of us in residential real estate were out of business until we were told we could go back to work. So it essentially shut down real estate for a brief period of time. It was three to four weeks later um, that the government deemed our profession to be essential, and those of us in real estate could go back to work again. Um, up until that time, 
we were enjoying a robust first quarter. It was a seller's market. And let me say that the year previous in the Bay Area, 2019, was one of those years where things had leveled off. Things had cooled off a bit. 16, 17, 18, those were hot sellers' markets. 19, things were plateauing. We weren't seeing the wild, crazy overbidding and every house selling with 10 offers in two days kind of a thing. We were beginning to see that happening in February. And as we got to the middle of March, which is typically when our prime spring market takes off, we had this, quote, interruption in our real estate market. And I'll call it that because that's what it ended up being. In By the time May came around, not only were real estate people back to work legally, but we couldn't show properties that were owner-occupied or tenant-occupied. It was illegal to do so. It wasn't until mid to the end of May that we could show occupied homes. So the only part of our market that could participate were vacant homes. And that represents about 20, maybe 25% of the inventory. So we had a market from March 17th until the middle of May, but it was a much smaller one. And by the time we got to June, now we had all these properties that were on the market and take it off, take temporarily, come back on the market, as well as a lot of sellers deciding to jump in again and put their houses up for sale. So... We now, from that, have this pent-up demand, and it pushed our spring market into the summer, and it's been very, very robust, uh, pretty much across the country from what I can tell, but most certainly in the Bay Area. It's probably one of the strongest sellers markets I've seen in a long time. And along with that, as an accelerant, are the interest rates. And you know, with what happened in the financial markets to stimulate the economy because of the pandemic, interest rates are at a historic lows at, in some cases, below 3%. Well, this pandemic is nothing like we've ever seen before in our lifetime. What lessons do you think this pandemic has taught us about the volatility of the housing market? Well, I guess I could say that you know, anything can happen in real estate. And to say that, oh, it could never happen is not the case. I've seen a lot of things happen in 35 years and, and significant things. And the pandemic is something that could happen again. We don't know if it's over. I mean, if there's a second wave, we could go backwards again. Nobody really knows. It's We're in uncharted territory. And the truth is, is that I don't think the full effects of the pandemic have really made its way into our economy yet. We've seen telltale signs of it, but we've also seen our economy propped up by the infusion of trillions of dollars for stimulus. But that really isn't solving the key problem. There are a lot of jobs that are going to be forever lost. There are a lot of businesses that have closed or are going to close that are never going to reopen again, which means that there are going to be a lot of people that are unemployed. And I think that at six months from now, we might see the full effect of the pandemic and how it's affecting our economy as a whole and our real estate markets, both across the country and locally. Okay, interesting to see what will happen the rest of the year with this pandemic and where it will take the, our real estate market. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this podcast. We hope you enjoy our real estate pro tips and strategies, and we encourage you to share our podcast with anyone you know who is looking to buy or sell a home. Be sure to like and subscribe, and if you're watching on YouTube, ring the bell next to the subscribe button so you won't miss a single episode. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lubman, with Painless Podcast for making this podcast happen. I'm Leslie Whitney with Pizza Bean, and we are the five-star real estate team. Join us for our next episode of Real Estate Pro Tips and Strategies. Call or text 925-297-5335 to reach us with your questions and referrals, or send an email to info at 5starrealestatepro.com. Thank you.